All right, so what uh, what I have uh, on on line forty eight is that uh, this image is still not quite behaving, partly because it's also in this uh, container. It has a width, it has position, etc. All of this would be better if it were also in an external uh, class because maybe I do want this design of a box but it's only being applied to this box so here's how we'll do it let's back up on line 48 we've got div in the attribute style let's create a new attribute before it called class um, class that needs a name we'll call it uh, div img full that is going to be the class that we can use on multiple divs throughout our project. If we're going to display our pictures consistently throughout the site, a class, CSS, is the way to go. That's part of the point of CSS. Consistency. So this has a class. We're going to define what that class means in the CSS file. So if you jump back to the CSS file, switch over to codica.css go to the CSS file we've got image full and before that I want to add dot div image full the order again matters in our case probably not so much it's a relatively simple thing we're trying to do but as the more complex we get the order definitely matters so what I've got here conceptually is I've got a larger container, a parent element, the div, and inside of it is a child, the image. So I want to write the parent code first that trickles down to the child element. A dot at the beginning, of course, because it's a class. This one I'm going to break up the curly braces into two lines. I kept this as one line because it's just one thing. This is going to define multiple things. And just for readability, to see them all easier, I'm breaking them into multiple lines. I could have kept it on one line, of course, but then when I come back to edit my code later, it might not be so obvious. And what I'm going to fill into this is what's in the inline style. I'm going to take away the inline style and put it here. So I'll go back to the index. And everything inside of style, everything in the quotes, I'm going to select it all and cut it. Not delete it, cut it. Cut and paste. So we have that class, we have this style. I'm going to cut out everything that was in that style. We don't need the style anymore anyway, either. So first make sure you cut all of that code and then delete the style attribute. We try to avoid inline style, remember. So divs should simply have a class. And all of that styling, all of that inline style that was there, we cut and we're going to paste into our div image full in the CSS file. Okay. And one of the properties is width, semicolon, position, semicolon, etc. Also, just for optional readability, I want to press enter after each of those properties, right? I want to move each of them to its own line after the semicolon. It would have worked a moment ago, and this will this should still work. But I'm just moving it to separate lines because when I have multiple properties that I'm affecting, I like to keep it on separate lines. Easier to read and edit. 
while we're here, I'm going to say, okay, the width, well, before we go further, save these files, view the result in the browser, It should not look different. It should still look the same, but you've got the picture. The point of this is that we can then reuse this class multiple times throughout the project. We can also edit this a lot faster. If it's in one central location, we can come back to our code a lot faster. What I want to change here is I don't want a hard-coded value of 288 pixels. 288 pixels might look good on a Samsung phone. It might look okay on an iPhone, but then it doesn't look okay on an iPhone 6 as opposed to an iPhone 5. It doesn't look good on a Samsung Galaxy S6 as opposed to a 5. A hard value like this, 288 pixels, also going from screen to screen. 288 might look okay on a mobile device, but it might be too small on a tablet. And it might be too big on a smartwatch. So hard values, pixels, pixels are dots. Exactly, 288 dots. That's not so good. We should often think in, ter think in terms of relative measurements. And an easy one to use is percent. I'm going to say this box, make it be 100% the width of the spot that it's taking up. So this will stretch to 100% of its container. It was a little smaller, now it's a little bigger. It grew a little bit more depending on the screen. Watch this, if I, did you see that you can also hit the rotate button up here and it sort of rotates it. It grew if I was landscape. The last icon on top here is rotate. If I switch it over to an iPhone, if I switch it to an iPad, that 100% is growing depending on the size of the screen. This one is not. This one has a hard value. It's always that size, and therefore it might not look the best as it could. So what our code is saying, that div container, make it be 100% of what it needs to be. Position relative, don't worry about that. Background color, there's a, there, there's a basic gray color behind the picture. You can change that, but it's behind the picture, you don't really see it. Border, there's a simple one pixel solid gray border around the picture. We haven't looked at this property of CSS yet. Border, you define how thick your border is, what style of border, and what color of border. Just to make it obvious, if you put five solid red, you get a thicker red border. You can put hex colors or named colors. Just to make it obvious. So every time I I'm writing some CSS with colors and such, and when I teach it, I have a habit of just typing pink quickly. So those people ask, why do you keep choosing pink? Well, I just realized because it's easy to type with one hand. If you know how to touch type, pink you can type with one hand, with your right hand. Or if I got on my left, red. You can type red with one hand. So just for speed, I quickly type pink or red. Any color, because the default color is white or transparent, and sometimes you don't see that. So if I put a visible color, that helps me figure out the pieces of the puzzle of CSS. So what this is supposed to do, if you then see the result, now there's a red, 
five pixel border around my picture and there's a little bit of pink behind the picture we can look up we've got different types of borders we have dashed notice how we have to write it a size of the border space a style of the border space and then a color so we have dashed we have solid what else do we have i think we have dotted there's a dashed line It's pink in the middle and red on the outside because there's a pink background behind the pink background color, so you see through it. There is a little weird space right there which we can remove. Um, I think I remember that one was a little trickier than I thought. Oh, no. Was easy actually. Okay, so if you add at the very end line dash height colon zero, there's a default. There's always defaults. We have a plain old paragraph, but it's not really plain. It has a black color, white background, transparent background. It has a it has a default font. It has a default line height, and line height line height is the space between your lines. There's some space here, even in Notepad. There's some space here. So we were seeing a little bit of that line height at the very bottom of the picture. We want to cancel that out. We want the border to be snug around the picture. If we didn't specify it, we got then a little gap. We removed it. Line dash height zero. No line height. No space between the border and the picture. Does anyone remember? Does anyone remember on a previous day we talked about adding rounded corners to our elements? Does anyone remember how to add the rounded corner? CSS code. Border radius. So we'll add a new element. We'll add a new property. Make sure we're doing it inside of the curly brackets. If you're doing it outside, it won't work because you're not applying it to the correct selector. This class here is a selector. It's selecting an element on the screen. That div. We'll add another property here. This was border dash radius colon space um, 25 px or whatever. We can define all of the four corners if we wanted. I think we do it by specifying the four values. Confirm it. <coughs> or it might be done a different way. Again, I don't have it all memorized. Yeah, it does. It looks really weird. But if you specify all four different sides, top, I think it's top right, bottom right, it's clockwise order, I think. We'll just make it easy. We'll say 25 pixels all the way around. Still looks a little weird. I see roundness, but then it looks cut off because it looks like the picture itself is not obeying the container that it's in. Again, here's why CSS, in my opinion, is the second of the harder, second hardest of the three languages. There's so many variables and factors and defaults and things that conflict. Um, for this one, I think we need to do is add another property. This one is overflow hidden. Oops. 
If only there was a place where we can look up all the possible properties. Of course, w3schools.com and many other websites. Do I need to have them all memorized? No, just enough of them to impress people, to give you the right answer. But overflow, colon hidden, will then hide the picture inside of it. Anything that overflows past this container will become hidden. So those corners that were poking out of the rounded corners of the div get hidden. I'm just choosing random colors. Those colors might not be the best. You can put whatever color you'd like, but that's my result. Rounded corners in the picture. If I change my orientation and size, they change as well. And that's from using percentages instead of hard values. There was a little bit of an empty space between the picture and the bottom of the border. We removed that empty space with line height. We'll, we'll have a day later on when we upgrade our colors to something more interesting. So don't worry too much about those sort of things just yet. Um, here's what I've got so far. From here, based on the example project, I want to be able to click a button to open a, uh, a pop-up screen. So let's work on that. That requires a little bit of setup. Let's pause right here. Did everyone get their picture rounded and so forth, like mine. Okay, so we'll work on uh, creating a pop-up window. Let's go to our code. Let's go back to the index file. On, uh, we'll work on that map a little later. But on line 54, we have a, a section that starts div class UI grid A, and this is our four quadrant grid. Um, we simply put A, B, C, D to show something on screen. Now that we know what that is and what it looks like, I, I will remove the letters, remove A, B, C, D, just so that I know what it is, but I don't need to display anything. What I want to type instead on line 56 on block A is about. We're going to have like an about screen that opens up. This is going to be a button. This is going to be a link. So we will wrap the A tag around it. The A tag needs an attribute, href. It's going to be a new screen. It's going to be a new section eventually. It doesn't exist yet. But I know we're going to create a section called about. So that has to be pound plus the, the ID of the section. We'll be very creative and it'll just simply be about. This will be a simple underlined link. Instead, I want a button, data roll, button. So now the link has been upgraded to be a button. The button often needs an icon, so data-icon. We saw this previously, remember? We have an icon for info, like a little I for info.
save it and run it, and you'll have a brand new icon on your home screen. It won't go anywhere yet because we don't have the destination set up. Now, why didn't my About button go all the way to the edge of the screen? Remember, we have data inline true. Data inline true forces a button to only take up a certain amount of space, the minimum that it needs. If we don't set data inline true, it's set to false, which is it'll stretch as far as it can. This is the default behavior, a big, wide, about button. Ours only takes up about half the size. You should tell, you should be able to tell, because it's in the grid. It's in the grid A. Block A is half of the grid, and B is the other half. First column, second column. First row, second row. So that button is taking up only half of the space of block A, column 1. Yes, basically, exactly. We need a new column, so UI block C. I believe, this one's always tricky for me also, because I believe we also then need to specify up here block B. A gives us two columns, B gives us three. And then we specify the content of the third column within UI block C. So what's cool about this is the jQuery mobile automatically creates an equal amount of space for our layout if we use grids. Okay, so now we need to create a, an end result. We need to create a screen to display this about information. It's going to be a new section. Let's go all the way to the bottom of the document. There will be a section that ends. There's a section that ends, and it's our computer's end screen. Let's create a new section. So above your jQuery mobile, add a couple of empty spaces there, line 234. We're going to create a new section. It has a pair. Data role, page, ID, about, Remember, not pound about. We only use the pound in the href. We need a header. Data roll header. This is something we've seen before. This will be about SDC. We need the article. This is the one that's role main and class. UI dash content. And then heading to, let's see, did you know that this college system is 100 years old? San Diego City College System, founded in 1915, so 101 years old.
And our college here, Continuing Education, is part of that system. So this college system has been around 100 years. We won't add a footer. I want this to be screen. Remember when we drew the different screens, A, B, C, D? This is going to be screen C, a pop-up screen. Save it and run it. You should see then your About button is active. And if you click it, it should show this screen. It's not done yet. We still have a few things to do. But at the very least, this should show up and it should say celebrate 100 years. And we'll put the polish. So make sure it's spelled right, of course, section, you've got a pair of sections and header, article. Article is the one that's unique, it's role, main, class, UI content. Everything else is a data role. I want to see if my code looks good, so I'll refresh, I'll click about. It says about SDCE, celebrating 100. I don't have any back button. I don't have any close button. I'm kind of stuck here. Remember, we can't rely on the back button. I'm almost there. We have another attribute to add to this section to make it behave like a pop-up. I want it to be a pop-up, not a full screen. I want it to be a pop-up. So we add, we'll add data role. Remember, we keep ID and class as the last attribute. <clears throat> so before that, we will add another data, this time data dialog, spelled dialog, not the other kind of dialog, this dialog, true. Make this page behave like a dialog box. Save it and run it, and you should see a clear difference. data dialog should look like this you click about look at that it's not full screen anymore and it's got a, a close button built in and I would like it to animate like a pop-up right now it just appears the default animation is fade I want it to pop onto the screen there's an animation for that we need to change the data transition So we need to go back to the top where we've got, back on line 56, we've got the data roll button, data icon info, we need data transition. There's one called pop. Pop works really well with pop-up boxes, with dialog boxes. So if we add that transition and I run it, see that pop up animation, even a basic thing like that is useful. You might say, well, it worked with the other way. It doesn't matter how it animates. Think about the apps that you yourself use. Think about Instagram, Snapchat, uh, Yelp, whatever you use. They often have some sort of subtle animations. That's one of the hallmarks of an app. Ours is a website at the moment. Eventually it'll be an app, an Android app, a mobile app. 
So we want our humble website to behave like a real app. Transitions, animations, are one way that help us create that feeling, that user experience. I want to add the college's logo. Remember we've got a graphic in our images folder. In our images folder we've got this image that I want to show. I'm going to borrow the code that's already here, lines 48 to 50. I'm going to borrow that chunk of code there. That's a, that's a div that is being styled and then an image inside of it. I want to borrow lines 48 through 50. Copy and paste, I mean. I want to copy and paste lines 48 to 50. Not cut, I want to copy. And I'm going to paste it into that about screen that we've created at the very bottom of the document, line 240, we have the heading celebrate 100 years in a paste. It comes in with that div for styling. It comes in with the other image, auto campaign, and I want to replace that with images slash vert dot dash bw dot ping all text will just say sdc I don't need to change any of those classes, I don't need to change the div, anything else I have these sort of uh, placeholders and for consistency Want to um, replace the auto campaign image with the vert bw image. If you downloaded it from the website, you have this picture, obviously. If I open about, there's the picture. I thought it was white. Does anyone know what's going on here? This picture is transparent. It's a transparent background ping. And in my code, the, CS, the CSS, I created a gray background behind the div. So this is a, this is a place I can just simply change that to white. So in my CSS file, I'm changing my background color of this container to white. Just like that. I think the edges are too close. That could be a, um, a cause for changing this to say padding 5px no, actually that would be How much percent? Hmm. 
Oh yeah, on the width of the image. Maybe one percent is good enough. So we we're seeing here that um, that it all relates to each other. And this is going a little bit too far to the edge over there. We can do over there some margin. Now, as we're changing this, I'm not done with it, but as we're changing this, this is also changing this over here. This is the good and the bad about CSS. The way we've done it is I simply thought, well, it looked nice on one picture, it'll probably look nice on another picture. Maybe. And as I'm trying to figure out one picture to look good, this is also affecting everywhere else that I've done where I've used that class. So we'll figure out the exact details in a bit, but um, this is, um, if I wanted to reuse that element, if I wanted to reuse that CSS on a particular element, there's the pros and the cons about it. So I've got a picture in the About screen. Oh, let me show you this that might be useful. We're jumping between the index file and the CSS file. We can change our view split screen so that we see both at the same time. Uh, if you right click uh, the CSS file, for example, right, right click its tab, at the bottom you'll see Move to Other View not instance. Move to other view and not clone. Move to other view. What you get then is on one side you get one file and on the other side you get the other. You can move this around. So now you can look at two bits of code at the same time like that. If you want to merge them back together you, you right click that tab again and you select again. Move to other view comes back. We've been editing uh, both of them at once. That's why it might be useful to bring them both up at the same time. Alright, so um, this map that we've got here itself, it's, it's also temporary. We're going to have a better live map eventually. This map we just had it there to see how it works. We're not going to need it, so we can delete it or we can comment it out. Maybe we'll comment it out because we might want to use it um, for some reason, and I don't want to lose the code, perhaps. So if you go back to... If you go back to um, index file, and back on line 50 or so, there's a line here that has 51 that has that uh, static Google map. I'm going to add the comment tag around it.
going to comment that out. Above it, maybe make another comment that says static Google Map. If we want to use that again at some point, the code is there, we just need to change it as necessary. Speaking of comments, we should go back down to the uh, About screen and add some comments there as we've been doing start of the PC screen, end of the PC screen. Start of the art screen, end of the art screen. We should do that for the About. It's not a very big section, but once we start to build more sections, at a glance we'll be able to tell what that section is. So let's go all the way down to, we'll go back down, all the way to the bottom, to that new section. We'll make those comments about screen start, about screen end. Now I don't have the map anymore on the home screen. Um, we have the art and computers screens to, to deal with. <coughs> you can add more content later. I want to address the computers screen. What computers is about is a, a list of some fictional classes regarding computers. So we'll go to the computers screen. We'll change our heading and then we'll populate these elements and actually make them work, make them do something. Let's go to our index file. And we have a section that starts at about 154. A new section of ID computers, computer classes. There's our nav bar. There's our main content area heading. Line 184, I'll say learn computers. And then we've got on 186 an unordered list with dividers and buttons. So we're going to say we've got basic computer classes, intermediate computer classes, advanced computer classes. That's what the dividers are for, the different types of classes. Then within a divider, we'll have a button for a class, a basic computer class, number one, number two, an intermediate one, etc. So we'll go over to 188, which is our first divider, and we'll call this basic computers. And 
This has a list, the data role of list divider. We've got another one here, 201. That'll be intermediate computers. So one divider is for basic, one is intermediate, we'll need one for advanced. So we'll have basic computers, intermediate computers, we'll need a whole new divider and a button for advanced computers. We should be able to reverse engineer that in order to create a divider, we need something that looks like that, a list item with a data role and a role. For practice, I'll type it manually first, then we can copy and paste, of course, later. But just for practice, we see that its setup is list item, list item, list item, list item, list item. So that means we need a new list item after the last button. So at about line 211, I added a new list item pair. It will need a data role and a role attribute. List dash divider. This is again jQuery mobile upgrading a plain old bullet point into a divider. Advanced. a new divider, and then it needs a button. It's another list item. This one doesn't need any sort of data role or anything, but it does, if it's going to be clickable, it needs an href data transition. A tag ABC for the moment href uh, pound sign for the moment it's not going anywhere yet data transition slide just to keep it all consistent I'm not using this span count. I'm not using it. I could if I want, but the point of span li count is for it to then show a little bubble of a number, like if I have seven messages, seven emails, seven classes. New button. Alright, so then I'm going to need a, to make up some classes here. Uh, if I back up a little bit to 192, uh, we've got uh, a button called button, but this is going to be a button to take you to, um, let's say, COM 101. The next button, 
COM 102. In the intermediate section, we'll call it COM 202, or 201, level 2. And then on advanced computers, COM 301. So instead of it, simply this is just so that it doesn't say so that it doesn't say uh, button something like that. Basic computers, COM 101, 102. Intermediate, 201. Advanced, 301. If I wanted to add more classes, we can see the format and we can add more. All of these are an href over to some screen that doesn't exist yet. We would need to create screen design B. We have A, B, C, D. A is every, every screen so far. C is the pop-up. B is the screen that focuses on showing you class info. We haven't created it yet. But eventually we're getting there. And because we have that drawing that we made, that plan of classes and such, or uh, screens that we're creating, we can kind of see what we're going to do eventually. So we'll have pound com base for both com 101 and 102. For the moment we'll make them both point over to some com base basic computer classes screen. In the intermediate computers, that one we can do com int and spell it all out, of course. We'll do the short names and com advance. These don't exist yet. If I save it and run it and I click, either nothing will happen or I'll get an error because they don't exist yet. We're going to create one of these screens and then we'll take a break. We're not going to spend our whole time creating each of these screens. This is something we've done over and over. So we'll create one of them as a placeholder, as a starting point. But each of these is pointing off to some brand new screen, which is a section These don't go anywhere yet. We're going to create a new section. So I'll go back to the bottom. We have the end of the computer screen, the start and end of the about screen. We need a new screen. So after line 255, might as well write here um, basic computers screen start end in between will be a new section get a little page ID we call it com base header we'll header article Placeholder. 
so here then uh, we're creating a new section for basic computers. We can uh, create this sort of a template. This is our screen design B. Uh, it's missing one thing we'll see in a moment. Uh, and if this is our template, then we can copy and paste it because we're going to need basic computer screen, intermediate, and advanced. Again, we're not going to spend time to do it in class. This is enough for you to hopefully extrapolate your next step. But let's see if it works at this point. So we're going to create this sort of section. Let me check that mine works. Com1, click that, slides over. No back button. We'll deal with that in a moment. But the transition takes you over. Both of those are clickable. They both go to the same place. These others don't work yet. We haven't invented them. There's no back button. These go to those screens. There's no navigation buttons here. Our design B, however, was not <clears throat> was not envisioned to have a nav bar. It was envisioned to simply have a back button. We did address that previously, last week. That is um, to our header 257. We add a new. We had a new data role, or data element, which was that, that, that funny one. Data-add-back-btn equals true. It gives you a simple back button in history. You go to the basic computer screen, you do what you need to do there. Simple back button at the top left to take you back. This is a more complete sort of placeholder uh, template for computer classes. From this we can copy and paste to then to quickly make uh, the intermediate computer screen and the advanced computer screen. So it should have a back button in the design. It is cutting off my text, basic computer. That's something we'll need to address with CSS later. Vertically, it looks like that. If we do horizontal, it does spell out. But this is the issue about the size of the device, the amount of space up there, the default jQuery is that it's going to cut off your text at a certain point. We didn't see that on other screens, perhaps. Now those screens work like that. These are the ones you'll need to build eventually. This is what we've got so far. So let's take our second break. I'm going to put my code up to this point into the network folder. We'll take a break and then we will uh, add some more content. I want to finish up the art screen a little bit more, add some things that are missing here. Not specifically content, that's, that's elementary that we can do uh, structure-wise. I still need to add a few things to art. So. We'll take a break until about 8.30, and we'll go on.